Go Ask Alice is a show intended for adult audiences because adults want to learn too. Sometimes we cover sensitive material, so please take care of yourselves and listener discretion is advised. Now on to the show. Hello, internet friends, and welcome back to another episode of Go Ask Alice, the show where we jump down random internet rabbit holes and bring you wonderful factoids from our adventures in Wiki Wonderland. I'm Sarah, and I was told this week that asteroids are not real, apparently. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. I'm Lindsay. It's not true. (laughs) No, it's not. Oh, dear God. You know what? On that topic, I'm Lindsay, and I had to stay strapped into a dentist chair hearing all about how aliens come from Mars, and that's where human life started. This is the show where we bring you, just like Sarah said, wonderful factoids from Wiki Wonderland. We roam the internet in search of the most interesting and exciting facts or trivia or honestly just really weird stories that we come across. We start on the same wiki page every week and we use hyperlinks within the article or on the web page to wander around the internet until we find something we cannot stop reading. This week we started on Moleskin, like the notebook, my like favorite notebook. favorite notebooks. I when I googled it, I'm like, oh, I hope it's not roadkill or something. <laughs> <laughs> The notebook, the very expensive overpriced notebook. Today it is just me and Sarah, so it should be a quick one. Sarah, where did you end up this week? I ended up on superstitions. Oh my god! Which I think you'll like. I've got some fun ones in there, and I did some off roading because I wanted to know weird superstitions. Um, but yeah, I'm especially interested in superstitions that I have not heard of before. I reckon there's going to be. I would be like to few. learn some new ones. <laughs> what about you? I'll integrate them into my life. On a very similar spooky, almost Ooh. conspiracy theory topic, Ooh. I landed on hidden tracks. Oh, like like walking tracks or like like the Inca lines? Oh, that's way cooler. No, it's <laughs> not even like, you know, it's not like crop circles. It's not anything like that. No, it's like audio hidden tracks oh okay that will be fascinating because i'm sure there's yeah it ones. actually it was even cooler than i thought it was but before we get started we need to answer our question of the question week of the week this week's question of the week is what is the most you've ever spent on an in-game app purchase could be a video game could be an app um Lindsay, you don't strike me as the <laughs> spending stupid amounts of money on a game no i've always been very morally against them and what's so funny is that our twitch affiliate gunshizer gunshizer sorry and schwanzi who is related to gunshizer so cut from the same cloth both were adamantly against anyone ever committing an in-app purchase ever 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 uh, in fact, Jean Schwanzi says that it's a scam and they it already get enough scam. money watching ads. It is a scam. Does that stop me from needing things immediately? No, no. because my answer is that I once spent $20 buying Pokeballs on Pokemon Go because I needed to catch Pokemon post haste. I've also done that. And so is Simon. <laughs> Simon loves Pokemon Go and like upgrading his bag continuously. <laughs> you sometimes you gotta sometimes you, you sometimes gotta. it's just worth it that's better than my one mine was What's i was yours? playing this like adventure app where it was like you're reading a book but you could pick what direction the story went in oh my god but i know what to, you're talking about yeah but for it to go in the interesting direction you had to donate like coins or gems literal coins and so you would earn the gems but you never had quite enough to do the like really interesting thing so i would be like oh yeah five dollars <laughs> sure it's like, bitch, you have an imagination. You could make this up as you go. But literally, Sarah, you literally just paid five dollars to read a book like again and I again. Know. <laughs> I know. I was so right. You could have just like written your own. I know. I'm never I'll never do it again. I probably spent like thirty dollars over a couple of weeks. Cause it was just one <laughs> <laughs> need to stop. That was that was months ago, so I'm I'm better now. <laughs> Are there any other This seems like an appropriate place? Mm -hmm. Yay. Are there any other audience submissions? That was it today, but I think that maybe we hit on something people feel shameful about because I don't think a lot of people like to admit. There's no shame, but I agree with with, uh, Gunshizer that it's a waste of money. 
I will also say that if you're a stay-at-home mom who is really addicted to Candy Crush and you spend money on Candy Crush, please come sub our Patreon. It's Go Ask Alice on patreon.com. And for much less than an in-app purchase, you can support our very small podcast, help us grow, and you get tons of cool stickers, literal physical prizes. It's not just making your backpack bigger or finding a cool story. (laughs) You get to fund our podcast. And if you subscribe at the highest tier, you get a personalized lab coat so everybody knows that you are the keeper of the facts. And... An entire episode dedicated to you. You get to pick the topics, the question of the week, all that good stuff, which you can do at lower tiers as well. So if you want to have fun and actually get bang for your buck, come along and join us. (laughs) Yeah, if you want a lasting legacy, please (laughs) don't Pokeballs. I don't even have that app on my phone anymore. Fuck, that's money gone. (laughs) Anyway, I think that what makes sense for our order is probably to do superstition first, get us in a good mood. And I think that'll broaden our horizons. And then I'll just take us off the deep end with like hidden tracks. Cuckoo bananas theories. Yeah. I'm excited. Okay. Okay. Well, I I guess I don't have to ask, do you know what a superstition is? I'd be concerned (laughs) if you didn't. No, I definitely do. But in case anyone in our audience isn't familiar with the word, perhaps Mm -hmm. it's kind of a long word. Superstition is... For anyone who doesn't know what it means, so a superstition is any belief or practice considered to be non... uh, considered by non-practitioners to be irrational, supernatural, maybe attributed to fate or even magic. A lot of them can be based around like this fear that if you don't do something, the unknown will happen. So a lot of it is, it depends on the superstitions have come from so many different cultures. But most of the time, it's this idea that it's like, if I do it, then more good will happen than than bad. And we can kind of think of it like the classic tropes of like, You know, don't break a mirror, otherwise you'll get seven years bad luck. Right. Like, nobody can prove that that's happened. And physically, from a scientific point of view, of course, that doesn't happen. But there's like a psychological thing that happens where you either, so you first of all avoid breaking a mirror, that's that's helpful for you. But if you do break a mirror, then internally, if you believe in that superstition, then you can kind of set yourself up for failure with your own internalized subconscious. So that's, yeah, that's what I was going to say is you kind of do it to yourself. Yeah. And it's kind of, it's commonly applied to beliefs and practices that surround like this idea of luck or even uh, like an amulet, like people have good luck charms or even like little worry dolls and things like that can be related to astrology, Lindsay's favorite topic. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Go on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it could be related to fortune telling. And the idea that if something happens or something doesn't happen, then that will set up your future. Oh, well um, put. Or, I think Lindsay will like this one. It could be related to spirits or paranormal entities just dabbling in your life. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> that, so they're all like the ideas of what the belief could be related to, um, which I thought was really fun. Because I, when I was reading this, I was like, well, I think superstitions are bullshit. I don't do any of them. And then I was reading and I'm like, oh, no, I do have superstitions. And I didn't even realize it. Tell me some of your superstitions. Um, So I often do that and I'll dive into the full background of what this one is. But if I say something um, like, you know, where you want good luck or something like that, I'll often say knock on wood and then knock yep. on something that's wood or touch wood and yep. i i that's like part of my personality did not realize it's a superstition but i always do it like you know I've always yeah like, oh yeah you know, lucy will live for a very long time touch wood type of thing yes i do that one religiously do do that? and I, and I, I almost have a sense of when I've done it enough. Like sometimes when I'm saying something really, really cursed, I'll just keep knocking wood the whole time I'm talking. <laughs> You're going to hate the origin. Really? I thought I knew the origin. So I'm Maybe interested to know if it's different. You probably do. We'll dive into it. It's religious. Most of oh, them are. I mean, then I think I know of a different origin. That's, Ooh, okay. I'm, I'm okay. intrigued to hear Okay, we'll dive into that. Um, 
But before that, I wanted to ask you, what are some superstitions that you've either heard of or that you actively do? So definitely the touch wood. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'll say that I, one that has greatly affected my life is that the one about black cats. And the reason that's affected my life is because somebody once told me that because of that superstition, black cats are the last to get adopted from shelters. And because of that, I specifically adopted black cats from shelters because I couldn't bear the thought. Kiki and Kiki too. Kiki and Casper. Well, Kiki adopted me in the wild. That one's a little different, but Casper, (laughs) Casper was a black cat I adopted from the shelter. Yeah, that one was my (laughs) choice. Yeah. That's a good one. Yeah, what about you? I have the origin of that as well. Oh, sweet. Okay. Yeah, because I grew up with a black cat named Cinta, pure black cat. She was beautiful. Um, But a lot of friends would be like, well, that's unlucky. And I'm like, it's just a cat. I calm down. Cool your engines. I don't know if it also counts as a superstition, but I have a, a weird thing about photographs facing the wall. Um, if I have like a portrait of somebody, oh, even if like I don't, don't know them, around. yeah, yeah, I feel like it'll even, you know, I know that it's just like a picture. Like I know it's literally just like dye or, you know, chemicals on a piece of paper. Like I understand what it is, but if I have even like a statue of something or a photo of something and let's say I'm cleaning or moves things around and it's like an inch away from facing the wall. Um, I'm afraid that it'll be angry at me and I turn it back around so that it can like see, quote unquote, see. I I don't know if that really counts as a superstition, but for some reason I get intensely uncomfortable when things are moved around like that. (laughs) I think it might. And I think because you're putting, um, forget what the term is, but it's like when you give things that that are inanimate. um, Oh, like personification? Yeah. Yeah. Or anthropomorphism? Yeah. Which I think I I do the same. Like I put all of Lucy's toys, like I don't just stuff them in her basket. I pile them up nicely because I don't want them to feel squished. (laughs) Oh, that's really cute. (laughs) It's kind of like I was at the airport not long ago and I saw this kid with like a teddy bear in his backpack, but the teddy bear's head was poked out of the zipper. So it was like zipper was around the teddy bear. Because he's got to breathe, right? Like can't put him in the backpack. That is so cute. (laughs) Okay. Okay. I think we should dive into some of the origins of the ones that we specifically believe in. So I did touch wood and I also did black cats because I knew, I knew you would have something to do with black cats. So (laughs) touch wood. I'll give you what what I found and then I want to hear what you thought it was as well. Good. Okay. Okay. So. From, from some of the research I found, um, there was it was written that there's, like, there's various different origins or meanings of this idea of touch wood. Um, and they, they come from different varied cultures as well. But some of it suggests that the roots were deep in Indo-European or even Celtic beliefs that spirits, either good or bad, resided in trees. And they could either be called upon for protection or chased away by knocking on them, like knocking on their home. And Yes, uh, that is what I've heard. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So Christians in particular linked the practice to like magical power um, of the wooden crucifix, which, okay. Oh, um, I did not hear that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, I like the ghosts fun. in trees. I like that way better. Most likely among all of these different theories, historians, different theories, historians have attributed the superstition to the late 19th century British children's game called Tiggy Touchwood, in which young players claimed immunity from being tagged by touching the nearest piece of wood. And adults <gasps> picked up on this habit and the phrase touch wood, which is commonly used Wait. today. But diverge for a second. When you're playing tag as a kid, like the tree is always base. Yeah. So you're I safe wonder if when that's you touch the, the tree. Yeah. I bet it's filtered down. That's yeah, so cool. Wood. Isn't that crazy? I love that. I also like this idea that it's um like the ghosts or the spirits in, not that anyone who knows me knows that I'm agnostic, but. I like this idea that, you know, you're you're keeping your spirit happy or at bay because it kind of goes back. There's um, also a Japanese tradition that spirits can live in inanimate objects. I think we might have covered this previously. Mm-hmm. 
And that after yeah. seven years or X amount of years, it's either good or bad for them. And you've got to treat yes. them with respect and things like that. So that flashed into my mind as well. I quite like that. You know, what's so funny is, so I had, I had heard that it was a pagan tradition, um, that there were spirits in the trees and you were like appealing to their help by knocking on wood. And so it's funny because ever since I heard that when I'm trying not to jinx myself, you know, if I'm like talking about like a car accident or something and I'm like hitting wood the whole time I'm talking in my mind, I'm like, come on spirit. If you're in there, like get out and help me. <laughs> You'll be get like your a wooden table and Yeah. You know, like some chair or bookshelf or something. And I'm like, wake up, <laughs> wake up and help me. <laughs> Meanwhile, your poor bookshelf is just rattling. You're like, please calm down. <laughs> well, so what do you do when you, when there's no wood around? Do you, I knock my head because I've I seen people head. do that. Yes. I don't know why people do that. I don't know. Maybe because I always am like, oh, I guess I'm a bit thick in there. So. <laughs> That's my logic, which is mean to myself. So I should stop doing okay. that. But yeah, I'll touch my head or I'll touch something that could be somehow derived from wood. But yep. it is superstition. Like if, I, if we're talking about stuff that, you know, it's kind of that idea that like that phrase you hear a lot, like the God forbid, which again, yeah, yeah. does not mean much for me. Um, but you do, I do hear people who it does mean a lot for and that's kind of their superstition. Where it's like, well, God forbid. And yeah, I think that's fascinating. I do say that as like a fail safe. I do say that as like, you know, whatever horrible malevolent spirits are listening that are going to make this come true. Like, God forbid, just put the (laughs) fucking thought out of your head right now. (laughs) Oh my God. So we should move on to your superstition, which is the black cats dedicated to Casper and Kiki. Okay. So... Though cats have often been associated with good uh, good luck rather than bad luck, um, I think we should go back. So the history of like cats in general as kind of like a companion um, dates back, you know, many thousands of years. But they were particularly worshipped as gods in ancient Egypt. Um, and, you know, they were quite beloved. They were like little companions, kind of like, you know, dogs are men's best friends. Kitties were, were humans' best friends back in the time. But this like kind of nice relationship and like love and admiration for the cats kind of took a turn for the worst um, for black cats in particular around the Dark Ages. So we're talking like 1200s Mm. AD. Relatively recent compared to the whole history. Yeah, yeah. So about less than a thousand years ago. Um, and it was because the Pope, George the Fourth declared them as an incarnation of Satan. Are you fucking serious? Which, calm the fuck down, George. It's just a cat, but... Wait, you know. okay, how, okay, also pause. Like, what are popes do? Okay, we've got popes declaring that that fucking Ugh. weather vanes have to be roosters. And now we've got another pope that's like, I hate black cats. It's like, are they bored? Like, should we, like, you know, give them a shovel or something? Like, go do manual labor? They're crazy white men who are like, (laughs) God has chosen me. Believe it. It's it's almost as bad as royal families who came in thousands of years ago and was like, yes, I'm chosen. (laughs) This is mine. Thank you. Right, right. Like, it is the whole thing in general is cuckoo bananas, but whatever. Not digress, digress. Don't want to offend anyone, but. I I went to a Catholic school. I feel like I'm absorbed. I experienced that that vibe and I did not (laughs) like it. (laughs) I always forget you went to Catholic school. That's so weird. I did. I think it's what made me resilient. (laughs) So back to the black kitties. So things only went downhill for black cats um, when in the Middle Ages – they started burning them at you know, in bonfires and in holidays no. like on Shrove Tuesday, um, even the first day of Lent or Easter. So these like kind of holidays and they kind of connected them to this practice of witchcraft. So they thought maybe they were satanic. They were not, you know, they were not good vibes, which is just evil. Like that's, first of all, animal mm-hmm. cruelty. But also, again, like a little bit bizarre that an innocent cat you think is like what satan has chosen to be okay honestly like, it's like have you, you never have been stung by a wasp yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah 
so that's kind of where that superstition comes from, like the bad luck book, bad luck because they're they're probably like evil or they're not good, and it's kind of just trickled on for like a millennia of people having this kind of superstition, Damn. which is really sad, and I don't think it helps with um like pop culture, especially in the past like couple hundred years where you get stories of like black cats that are associated to witchcraft or things like that, like. I'm thinking mm. like Sabrina, the teenage witch, even though that cat is incredible. Hocus pocus. Come, hocus pocus as well, yeah. Yeah, if you come from like a religious background, you're probably not going to like that and have some connotations to it. So, yeah, all of that to say, I think it's bullshit and I think black cats are great. It is. I mean, I, I love my black cats so much and I know that Jean has like five black cats. <laughs> Um, so I'm sure that he would also emphatically support adopting <laughs> black cats. But the other thing, too, is that people even today, you know, people are just fucking crazy. And I remember that growing up, one of my best friends had a black cat. And around Halloween, around the Halloween season, they used to have to keep their cat indoors completely. Oh. It used to be an indoor outdoor cat because they were afraid of what people in the neighborhood, you know, might do. And, mm. you know, we live in like New Jersey. It's not like, you know, some kind of crazy ultra religious sort of area where that would be a problem. But it's like some it's enough that people still take precaution or like I said, that statistically they get a little bit left behind. Actually, I think yeah. now that statistic has morphed into they're not seen as being Instagram worthy enough like they're not as easy to photograph black cats so that is another reason (laughs) well it's also funny because it's like anytime my cat's doing something like hilarious and I try to take a picture it's just this like billowy void (laughs) and it's like I have to describe I have to put like all text (laughs) (laughs) which for anyone who doesn't know so Lindsay and I obviously astronomy nerds slash that's our career um there's something called a bok gobule where they are like some of the darkest places in a galaxy because they're so dense and fluffy with gas and dust and they just look like big black cats yeah google Google bok gobules they're excellent they are great (laughs) (laughs) but you know anytime i feel i guess kind of sad about that i like to read edgar Allan poe's cats of ulthar do you know that story sarah no I don't remember if that was a black cat in the Cats of Ulthar, so I have to check that. But the premise is that there is a cat who, I guess, um, falls prey to the abuse of a very cruel man. And Mm. it's a very creepy, fun, uh, very famous slow burn of a short story where eventually that man completely disappears and you come to find that all of the neighborhood cats keep gathering at his house. So the cats get their revenge on this man and it's just very triumphant and creepy all at once. So anytime I'm feeling sad, I read that. That is amazing. I will have to read that. Sounds like a good story. Oh, shoot. That's H.P. Lovecraft, not Edgar Allan Poe. Thank you, (laughs) Jean. I will edit that. (laughs) My favorite H.P. Lovecraft story. Cats of Ulthar. (laughs) So I thought I'd finish up on um, some other bizarre superstitions, but mainly around peanut. Um, Because I knew of this one superstition that happens at JPL. And I wanted to kind of expand... What other peanut-related superstitions are there? And it turns out there's a few. Really? And yeah. One of the biggest ones is actually by like in NASCAR. I don't really know what NASCAR is apart from like fast cars, but apparently it's a massive superstition that no peanut shells are allowed on the track in the pits. No peanuts, what? no peanut shells. Yeah, and not because anyone's allergic or anything like that. It's because back in the very early days of NASCAR, there were a couple of fatal crashes where peanut shells happened to be found near the wrecks of the drivers who died. And so it was just a superstition that it was, you know, bad luck to have the peanut shells. Really? Yeah. That is bizarre. And it's so funny, like these like ultra super powered, really fast turbo cars. And then it's like tiny little peanut shells. I know. (laughs) I know. And I thought that was adorable because the one that I had heard of was actually peanuts with good luck. And it's, they always have them in the JPL mission control room, especially when they're doing like mission critical stuff. So they're either launching a new spacecraft or, um, you know, they're, they're trying to land something on Mars or they're trying to communicate with Voyager, like something that's really, really tricky. And it's because back in the days in the 1960s, way before Apollo, this was for, um, 
uh, the the first Ranger mission, missions where they were trying to test certain spacecraft things, the first seven um, of them completely failed. And they either failed to take off, they failed oh. on launch, they, they just kept failing. And thankfully all uncrewed. Um, but on the, the seventh launch, someone had brought peanuts into mission control and that was the only launch that was successful. And they had <laughs> like gone over everything, everything between six and seven identical, almost like most identical that you could be. And the only difference that they found was peanuts. And that's a tradition <laughs> to always have your lucky bowl of peanuts in the room. <laughs> I've never heard that before. That's amazing. Yeah, so <laughs> they are my superstitions, and I would love to hear what else people think are superstitions. Um, oh, yeah. On our Twitter or our Instagram or our Patreon, please give us your favorite superstitions because I'm very keen yeah. to hear them. Go ask Alice Pod on Twitter. Go ask Alice Podcast on Instagram. I really need to hear what everybody's favorite superstitions are because <laughs> I there is clearly some I've never even heard of before. Um, There's one in Russia for the Cosmodrome for the space space program where crew were forbidden to attend the rollout of the rockets or the Soyuz um, and because it's meant to be really bad luck. Like if you see your rocket rolling out, then you've just hexed yourself to, to certain death. And oh my God, like a bride before the wedding day. Exactly. And so instead, yeah. they just send all of their astronauts to go get a haircut. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's really cool. Uh, it's good. Are you ready to discover some hidden tracks? I am. I am ready. So all I can think of, I guess, is the Simpsons episode where there was that like pop group and their subliminal like hidden track. If you slowed down their song, was to join the army and like Bart. Oh my god! With it. <laughs> that it's very similar. Like okay. I was actually about to say that tracks is kind of a bad way to summarize this because it's. Part of the trouble is that I'm trying to summarize audio yes. over many different media. So tracks is tracks are what I actually think of as on a CD. You have yeah. like track one and two and whatever. Yeah, I guess that's just kind of the way that, that I grew up. But I wanted to actually start off by asking, have you ever found one? Have you ever accidentally come across a hidden track before? No, no. I've seen pictures. Oh, not pictures. I've seen videos and audio of people who have like slowed down or sped up different songs to uncover hidden tracks. But, and apparently it was super popular in the nineties to, to hide things on CDs, but uh -huh. I've never come across it myself. Have you? So I did once in the wild in and the wild. I was going to ask how you felt. Yeah. In the wild, I felt like it was a mistake. I felt, I felt kind of weird. Like I just, it's almost like when you accidentally open the stall door and someone's in yeah. there. Oh. Uh, it felt like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like I'm I, so sorry. It, which is hilarious because it's like, you know that these artists put it on there intentionally or they know about it, but it still really felt somehow embarrassing and invasive. So this is really going to put a target on my back, but I used to listen to the used which was an emo band from probably a decade, a decade and a half ago. They have an album called Lies for the Liars. And on that CD, there is a song called Smother Me, which is one of my favorites. And it's this like beautiful, slow song. I still love that song so, so much. Sorry. Again, I'm going to get so much emo hate for my bad music. <laughs> but <laughs> at the end of that song, there is a super long silence, like minutes long. And then there's like a 30 second clip of just some little jam. And the lead singer is going, queso, dia, queso, dia, queso, dia, queso, dia. <laughs> just keeps saying queso, dia. And it like really ruins like this slow, beautiful like song. It was just so terrible. But I had downloaded that song forever ago on like LimeWire or something, like some like video or audio downloading site back in and I thought that it was a mistake yeah I thought I thought it was something to do with the recording I found but sure enough uh, Wikipedia has a list of secret hidden tracks and I confirmed that it was on that list I was excited to add it to the list if it wasn't there already but that is a known hidden track there are hundreds of them and kind of just to be sneaky, a hidden track of my own on our Twitter, I had asked our audience, what is their favorite Easter egg that they've ever discovered? No. I didn't want to give it away what my topic was. So Schwanzi or Jean had replied that recently he 
had was playing a video game and there is a game called Bloodstained Ritual of the Night and the What a uh, game name. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've never That's played it. Amazing. It seems pretty awesome. But what's so cool about this Easter egg is that when you enter the level, the art style of the game actually changes and it becomes an 8-bit game and a nod to Castlevania. That's so And it was so really cool. cool. Jean even posted a picture. Yeah. That's very cool. And uh, our favorite, well, maybe not favorite because it's, it's mean to pick favorites, but our ultra supreme number one fan, Muggle Watcher, yes. also replied. We love Muggle and Watcher. Muggle Watcher's... Yeah, we like super like sorry, One of sorry our first everybody Patreons who we also love. Ever, we ever, will ever forever like love you. closest. <laughs> <laughs> you have some stuff coming Muggle in the Watch. mail. Keep an eye out. <laughs> Just a little personal message from Muggle Watcher. <laughs> you have something in the mail. <laughs> yeah, probably arrived by now. But that's, you know, just that's, communicate. That's. That's the kind of personal one-on-one closeness you get with <laughs> Patreon.com. Is that you get little one-up. <laughs> Muggle Watcher, don't forget to brush your teeth today before you, bed, <laughs> you go to bed. And you have something in the mail. We love you. <laughs> We're proud of you. <laughs> I'm sorry. What did Muggle Watcher say? Apparently, in the movie Predator 2, there is a hidden alien skull. Ooh. And... You know how Alien versus Predator is another one of, of the movies where they cross over the franchise. So that is his favorite. And he said, the first one I, it was the first one I ever saw. So it has a special place in the hole in my chest where a heart should be. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah. So you, chances are you have probably also come across, probably as I'm saying this, maybe thought of one that you have also encountered. Please let me know, especially on Twitter, because uh, that's where I live. So I... I'm always keen to discover new Easter eggs and hidden songs, but I had written down some famous examples, but also all of the clever ways that people have hidden tracks in their music. And they are pretty fucking cool. So I guess the best place to start is first a huge nod and a huge shout out to Ernie Smith. He is a writer for the website and I think kind of a newsletter, Tedium. And this website goes through the tedious or boring pieces of internet history or just history in general. So a lot of this was, it really is. I signed up for the newsletter. (laughs) So So huge shout out. Some of this is from an interview with Ernie Smith, who uh, did a, a bunch of research on this. And according to him, the first hidden track is actually from the Beatles. Wow. I was going to say was the first hidden track from like, forever ago you know how there was those clay vases where if you play it you can hear things i have not no it was like very first very early the idea of a record but not really it was like you can put sound because you could play over it and hear things but the beatles is much more recent that's surprising yeah was it on a record like a physical vinyl you're right yes it was on a record and there, the reason actually that it ended up there. So I'll talk a little bit about reasons why people do hide tracks. But this one was kind of anticlimactic. There was just no good spot on the record to put the song, and I think that they were even considering not putting so it on the like record at all. Overlaid it at a different frequency or something. So actually, way, way, way after the record was done on Abbey Road, actually is the record that it was on. Her Majesty, the song comes way, way later and was a hidden track. Wow. After a long silence. Yeah. So I guess, I guess in modern history, that is one of the first ones. But speaking of records, the most clever, I think, of all of the ways to hide music was actually, in my mind, done by Monty Python. I love Monty Python (laughs) so much. Get a load of this. They had a record called Matching Tie and Handkerchief, and both sides said side two. But the way that this worked was it was a record that had, you know, the way a record works is that it's got all of these grooves in it. You put the needle in the grooves and it plays. Well, there was a double track on one side of the record that was spaced such that it was in between the regular track. So you had the to reason find they it. did, yes, that you had to physically find it on the record, an alternate track. 
that wow. had the like literal physical track. Um, here I am using the bad vocab I didn't want to use. A literal <laughs> set of grooves that were different on the record itself that had the hidden track on it. And they were recorded as saying that the reason they did this was because they thought it would be super funny if some stoned teenager, you know, back in the 70s, because they knew that their audience was a bunch of just like, yeah. you know, pothead stoner kids. They thought it'd be so funny if they accidentally made a mistake while they were setting the record to play. And then all of a sudden this new song and new sound (laughs) came out and totally scared the shit out of them. (laughs) Oh my God, that is amazing. I love them so much. I think Monty Python are (laughs) the voice of our generation. It's It's so good. But some other techniques that people have used, actually, so I was familiar with the song or the sound that came later after a long silence, like I was saying, with the used. And a famous one that you actually touched on, Sarah, in the 90s was Nirvana. Oh, okay. Um, So Nirvana on their album Nevermind had a long stretch of silence and then the, the track Endless Nameless, which I think actually became pretty popular. Oh, wow. But that's not the only way... To hide a song on a CD, actually. Okay. Can you hide it so that you have to have like a certain... Because a CD is from light reflecting off different different grooves. It's like a record, but different. So could you, could you uh-huh. hide things that needed a different wavelength of light to be refracted? Oh my God, that is a brilliant idea. It's I'm actually sure it very exists. similar. Well, okay. I think extremely similar to that science, albeit I did not get into that science... Marilyn Manson had a CD that required an enhanced CD executable, meaning that you had to use a separate program on your computer and you could only hear it on your computer. So you would put your CD into the computer and use this enhanced CD executable to play it. And that's how you would find the hidden track on his CD. That's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's people listening who have never touched a CD. Oh, probably. But... (laughs) (laughs) How hard is it to figure out? If we can figure out records, they can figure out CDs. (laughs) One method I did not know about. So again, this may be just me and Sarah uh, vibing over our age. But when you put in a CD to a CD player, it immediately starts and and the text along the, um, I guess the CD player would say like track one or even like track zero. If you hit back to skip back a track, some records have a hidden track zero zero that is before that yes. is so but cool. You can, you can only get there manually. When you put it into the to the CD player, it will not automatically start on that track. You have to you have to hit back, back. a oh. bunch of times to find it. I wish I still had a CD player and CDs to go and test and, and try find hidden tracks. But I own none of those things totally. anymore. I know, me neither. But you should totally check the wiki list to see if Mm -hmm. any of your childhood favorite. So this one, one of the examples I wrote down was this band called Ash, and they had put their songs before. But another one that I loved, I I had not heard of Ash, and there was another band called Super Furry Animals. These were both from the 90s. (laughs) What I loved about Super Furry Animals was that the lyrics, so, okay, back in the day for kids who don't know, when you bought a CD, you had like a CD case or a jewel case that was plastic and there was an insert that you could take out and the insert also had the lyrics and to the songs so and the order good. that they were in. It always smelled amazing because it was the whatever chemical that it was printed on was my favorite. So, fun fact, I don't know if you know this, but so my uncle is is a, a singer-songwriter artist, was in a big band in the 90s and so my mom helped run the Say fan it. club. Say name it, drop, name drop your uncle. Darren Hayes and Savage Garden so mum helped when he (laughs) entered his his solo career mum was helping run the fan club and part of that was like every time there was a new album release it was like special things for the fan club and one of them was like special like signed insert slips so we would take them all out send them out to wherever he lived in different countries but send them to him he'd sign them or he'd sign them when he was back in Australia and then would slip them back into the album covers and that smell was so good I loved the smell (laughs) of the insects I love that you had that I think of that with like video games or like I remember getting like a new Game Boy game or Game Boy Color game and they also had like the little booklet that would come out and you would do it with that too yeah Uh, I miss physical things because now everything's digital and it's real sad. So Jean, our 
co-host and just all-round legend who's like, I totally had a crush on Darren Hayes when I was a kid. He would be so <laughs> I wish I could have seen his face when he realized that that was your <laughs> uncle. <laughs> You would, you would love yeah, him, Gene. He's releasing a new album um, this month called Homosexual, and it is so camp and so amazing. It's really, really good. And he follows us on Twitter, not going to brag. <laughs> Gene just sent a little, little love heart face. <laughs> Cute. So the reason I brought up the CD panel mm. at all, actually, is because when – Super furry animals, my my example from before that I wanted to bring up, when they had their hidden track hidden at zero zero, so all the way before the very first track on the CD, they also hid the panel of their insert in the inside the rest of the, so it was folded such that you would actually have to physically remove the insert that had all of the like you know <sighs> lyrics and stuff like that you had to remove the pamphlet and unfold it to find the panel of the pamphlet that had the, the lyrics for the hidden lyrics. track That's yeah so they cool. physically hid it i thought that was badass that was such a great idea <laughs> but you were totally on some of the more unique ways that people have come up with that totally blew my mind. Uh, but I'll start off with a funny one. A band called Laszlo Bane <laughs> had at the end of their album, 57 blank tracks that were four seconds long. So it wasn't that you just sit there and wait, but you actually had to advance 57 times. And this was so that the 69th song on the CD was a hidden song. <laughs> <laughs> So people get really creative. Um, Another (laughs) one that I really, one that I really, really loved very much in the spirit of uh, Monty Python was Weird Al had a hidden track. Yeah. But his was after a long period of silence specifically to accidentally scare the people who had forgotten to turn off the CD player. It was a very loud (laughs) one. (laughs) That would have scared the shit out of me. Yeah. It, me too. And it would have worked, right? Because I definitely was lazy about turning off the CD player. It turns off on its own sometimes. Yep, that would have scared the shit out of me. This gives but me perhaps... vibes of people who put in like, hey, Alexa, in um, like in media, like in TV shows to get people's Amazons or Alexas <gasps> to, to light up and respond. People do that on purpose? Some people do. Yeah. There's been a couple like today so annoying. Today shows or tonight shows where they do it and they'll be like, hey, Alexa, order me a pool noodle or whatever it is. Um, That's so fucking annoying. <laughs> yeah. Like imagine you're playing TV for your dog or your cat while you're away at work and then it's like <laughs> ordering things on your Alexa. What the <laughs> fuck? We're also sorry to any of our listeners for whom Sarah just ordered a pool noodle. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I think especially in the same spirit of conspiracy and mm. superstition, my favorite way of hiding a song is called a ghost track. Ooh, okay. So it is a track that is at a different frequency than the rest of the the music. These are the ones I've heard of. This is what you were talking about. So it just happens to be quieter. And when you go in to, let's say you pull it up on GarageBand or Reaper or some other audio editing software where you can see the multiple tracks, you can separate the drums, the guitar, or even different frequencies. There is a quieter separate track, using the word track yet again, but here it means, you know, a different audio file or audio track sorry (laughs) you take a shot every time Lindsay says track (laughs) (laughs) you'd be off your rocker guys I'm so sorry (laughs) I love it don't apologize (laughs) oh my god everyone's wasted it's my fault (laughs) um what you would now I'm gonna try so hard not to what you would what you would have to do is mute or turn down the volume of everything else other than this mystery strain of audio mystery track. and no <laughs> just... 
raise the volume of that track. Sorry. All right. Raise the volume of that track specifically. And that's how you would find the song. So actually Nine Inch Nails did this. They had an Ooh. album that was called Ghosts 1 through 4. And if you play it through a computer, you have to go in and edit the audio and you can bring out a secret song. Wow. That is very cool. I wish we had the skills to put in a secret message to our episode. We don't. Don't look for it. But maybe we can try. <laughs> That's what she would say. That's what she would say. But I thought that it would be really cool to talk about some of the reasons people hide hidden tracks. I've given you a bunch of examples. And I especially wanted to frame this with the, the kind of sad truth that mystery tracks or hidden tracks, ghost tracks, these are all words people will use. And I want you to just keep taking shots. These are kind of a lost art nowadays Mm. so i'll go over some of the reasons people used to do them but nowadays actually because most of our music consumption is through spotify or other audio streaming services you can't really do this in the same way that you used to be able to or maybe it's a lot more obvious when when it is there so if an artist releases an album and has something that's called a bonus track that's what has either replaced it, taken the place, right. or it is that mystery track that's now made obvious. Right. That makes sense. In fact, it some studio recordings will flat out refuse to do hidden tracks now, um, especially because you make money per listen to the song, I believe, like, you know, however many plays you get. So you don't want to be hiding, I guess, that, that yeah. audio, especially because people are cherry picking individual songs to begin with. So... Hiding songs has kind of been a lost art, but some of the reasons people did it were uh, like Weird Al to scare people. Sometimes it was a demo of a song and it was just so low quality that it did not belong on the rest of the CD. But they still (laughs) wanted it out there. Yeah, they just wanted to get it out there, but didn't want to offend the people who paid good money for it. So they hid it. Uh, Another interesting reason is to get around copyright actually so the ramones had a song that was called carbonara not glue and carbonara was a type or sorry oh my god carbona let me go back they had a song called carbona not glue and carbona is a type of alcohol and they didn't want to get sued by carbona so they hid the song in a hidden track and then we're like i don't know i don't know what you're talking about we didn't really release that on purpose (laughs) amazing not ours it's not ours it slipped and fell and ended up on there yeah, it's accidentally on the... Oh, Oops, sorry. I printed it now. Can't take it back. Uh, and one that actually you could relate to probably with your story with your uncle is that sometimes the CD inserts would be printed before the CDs were done. And so it was a situation where, yeah, okay, the the list of all the songs is already printed. All the lyrics are already printed. We can't physically reprint everything. So we have to hide the song so that it looks like it was a bonus (laughs) instead of something we forgot to do. (laughs) That's amazing. And the best that I saved for last is that people do it to surprise their dedicated listeners. So my favorite example of this is that there was an album from, of the X-Files where the creator, Chris Carter, at the very, very end, after a long period of silence, explains the entire mythology, spoilers, everything that has to do with the show overall, and intense details. It was like basically just the insider scoop from Chris Carter himself at the very, very end of the CD. I love X-Files, and I really want to hear what he had to say. Me fucking too. I want to know exactly what, because apparent, apparently he gets deep into the symbolism of the like, you know, what is it that the aliens actually represent? What was the artistic vision of everything? And yep, stuck it all in the end for people who are true, uh, true, true believers. Fans. Wow. That's amazing. I love it. That it makes me really want to go and hunt for hidden tracks. Thank you guys so much for hanging out with us. Um, If you've ever seen that Venn diagram I put on Twitter of what happens when Drew's not here, it's that Lindsay and Sarah get themselves canceled or into some weird conspiracy (laughs) shit. And thankfully, it was not the canceling. It was the weird conspiracy shit. (laughs) So many conspiracies. (laughs) 
<laughs> so I hope you enjoyed it. the depths of this episode, and I hope it leaves you with a bunch of really strange question marks hanging around in the back of your head. Um, as always, thank you to all of our patrons who support us. We absolutely love talking to you and, you know, reminding you about little things in your life. Like, don't forget to check your mail. <laughs> I was going to say, don't forget to check the stove. But if you're listening at work, I don't want to make you paranoid that you didn't turn the stove off. You never know. <laughs> but you also never know. But you should also, yeah, you should also check that. <laughs> Okay, guys. Um, well, that'll do it for us this week. And uh, we love... Bye. Bye. Same with Indigenous Australians. It's bad luck or like bad superstition to see photographs of the dead. So like any historic... So a lot of in Australian media and websites um, where there's photos of like the indigenous custodians from like a hundred years ago, there's massive warnings before you click through to the website to say you will see deceased persons.